Agutavach, Agutavach, everybody. Thank you for gracing us with your beautiful countenance and presence. Agut Giben Shdior to all of you and all of your loved ones, but everybody joining us here this evening and all of our brothers and sisters the world over. Thank you to the Fitcha Ben Shimon on the music. And thank you to the Bioli Lebovich, Angshir Elabepe. And thank you to the Shmuel on the video. And thank you to everybody who's here, both physically and virtually. Everybody should have an amazing, incredible, and blessed year materially and spiritually with health, happiness, prosperity, nachas. And Hashem should fulfill all of your heart's desires. The most manifested and revealed goodness. Amen. So the Baal Shem Tev says that everything that a person sees is a lesson. And everything that a person hears is a lesson. It's not just random coincidence. If you see something or you hear something, he says it's a hero in Avedis Hashem. A person could learn from it. So somebody sent me a few days ago a story about the Queen of England. And as I listened to the story, I thought that there's a very, uh, very, uh, actually the person who sent it to me also sent it with the, le- with the lesson and it was, it was meaningful. As you know, the Queen, the Queen Elizabeth II died uh, last Thursday, September 8th, in, uh, in the afternoon. And since then, the world has been occupied with uh, talking about her, her life and her death and her funeral that's still going on. So somebody shared a story. They interviewed one of her uh, personal bodyguards. His name is Richard Griffin. He was a bodyguard of the Queen for around 14 years. He was her personal officer, her security guard, who escorted her for protection. So he shared that uh, once for a weekend, she went to uh, Balmoral Castle. One of the royal castles is called Balmoral Castle. I think it's in Scotland. And she would go there for weekends. And it was a very private place. And she would stay there for the weekend. And they would walk around. She would have some picnics there. She would take walks. And he would accompany her as her uh, bodyguard. And they would chat. So he said one weekend, they were taking a walk together. And usually there was nobody there. It was so private. It was really, you would barely see a soul. But once in a while, you could see somebody, and she was always very cordial and nice, and she would greet everybody she met, and they would move on. Once he was walking with her, and they were just chatting, and uh, there was nobody to be seen, but suddenly they see against them two hikers who have been hiking near the hills, and they approach them. She was wearing some uh, kerchief on her head, so the two hikers who were Americans, he said, did not recognize that uh, this was Her Majesty, Queen Elizabeth, the Queen of England. He thought it was just uh, an older woman walking with a fellow. So they greeted her, they said hi, and she said hi back to them. And they started to schmooze, and they started to tell her that they're from America, and they came for a touring, and they're hiking here, and where they went yesterday, and where they're going tomorrow, and what they're doing today. And then they turn to her and they say, and where do you live? She says, I live in London. What are you doing here? She says, I have a house here. I have a house here that I come to on vacation. How long have you been coming to this house, they ask her. She says, 80 years. So the security guard, he sees, you know, they're, they're, you know he sees the, <laughs> the wheels in their brain turning. And they look at her and they say, 80 years? If you've been coming here for 80 years, it must be that you met the queen because the queen lives somewhere in this area. So she says, I actually never met the queen, but this fellow, this fellow standing in near me, he meets her regularly. So they look at him and they say, really? You meet the queen regularly? Yeah, he says, yeah. They say, what type of uh, person is she? What type of personality does she have? So he says he knew that she was a witty woman, the queen was a witty woman, and she had a good sense of humor. So he knew he could be a little humorous. So he says to them, she is very cantankerous. Cantankerous is a classic British word, an English word. It means very argumentative, very hot-tempered and never cooperates with anybody. A very difficult person to deal with. 
but she has a wonderful sense of humor. That's what type of person she is. They say, really? Wow. So you literally know the queen. And these two guys come over to him, he says, and they put their hands on his shoulders, and they give the camera to the queen. <laughs> and they say, would you please <laughs> take a photo of us? Here's a person who, who meets the queen regularly. <laughs> she says, absolutely. And she takes the camera, and uh, her majesty takes a photo of him with these two guys. And then they say, you know, let's take a photo with you as well. <laughs> So they come near her, and he takes a photo of her, of them with her. And then they move on. They say goodbye to each other, and they move on their walk, and they move on their hike. And she turns to uh, Mr. Griffin, and she says, you know, I would love to be a fly on the wall. When they come back to America, and they show the pictures to their friends, and hopefully somebody tells them <laughs> who I am. And I'd love to be there, a fly on the wall. This is what he shared. And I thought to myself... First, I liked the line very much. She said, you know, I never met the queen, but he meets the queen. Sometimes, you know, you have to meet yourself, right? Sometimes you're a noichi, the Kotzke Rebbe said, but of cooking of zich. The story that there was once a Jew, a chassid, he came to the Chidush Yarim, to the first Gere Rebbe, Rebbe Chimei, Rebbe Chimei Alta, the Chidush Yarim, and he was staring at him. So he said, why are you staring at me? So he said, because the Rechaim says in the Pasuk, that you should look at a tzaddik. So I'm looking at you. So the Chidush Yerim says, it says, <laughs> It says that every Jew is a tzaddik. So maybe you start looking at yourself. Start looking at yourself. So sometimes you have to meet yourself. That's number one. But then I thought, number two, a person could be in the field hiking, and you're talking to Her Majesty, the Queen, but you don't know. You don't know it. <laughs> so you think you're talking to somebody who met her, and therefore you want to take a picture with him, because he will tell you about her when you're actually in her presence. In her presence. And they never knew. Maybe today they know. But then they didn't know. And I thought to myself, this captures so vividly the famous metaphor of the Alter Rebbe, of the Balatanya, about Elul, Melech Basada, the king is in the field. Lahavdal, of course. We're talking about the king of kings. But what's the marshal? The Alter Rebbe, the Balatanya, and the Kutatari, the Parshas Rei, the Maim Anila Doidi Vidoidili gives the metaphor that during the month of Elul, the king comes to the field and he wants to hang out, Kavayachal and be, with all of, the sub all of his subjects, but not in a way that they have to go to the palace and get dressed up, and over there you need protector, and you need to get permission, and you have to wait a long time, and you have to get dressed properly. But the idea of Elul is it's not a days of Yom Tov, it's Yimei HaChoyl, it's regular days, and yet, Arizal says there's a tremendous revelation of the Yom Tov, because it's like the king is in the field. The king is walking around in the field and wants to meet everybody the way, you're hiking the way, you're farming the way, you're walking the way, you're talking, gate as you are in your natural, authentic, raw self, Sometimes we feel that I need to go to somebody else. I have to find somebody who met the king or met the queen and take a picture with them. And you don't realize right here, right now, you could be intimate in the presence. You're in the presence of Melech Malcham Lachem. You could share whatever is on your mind, whatever is on your heart, with full vulnerability. There's a beautiful metaphor of the Baal Shem Tov. The Baal Shem Tov, it's actually based on a medrash. The Baal Shem Tov once said, it was before Rosh Hashanah, so the Baal Tov, before Yishan Yom Kippur, so the Baal Tov said that, you know, the custom in many shuls is that they hire for sliches and for Yom Neirayim, they hire a beautiful, beautiful chazun, a beautiful cantor, a baltfila, like Reb Yoyal or other baltfilas, to inspire the crowd. You have sliches, you have, they advertise all the big chazonim doing their sliches in, and Yom Neirayim, the big cantors, this is their time to shine. And shuls also, they make sure that their rabbis are Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, is the time of the year. They give their sermons and their drushes, their presentations. So Moshe says, I'll tell you a story. He says, once, the Gemara says that the king, that the, 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 the lion is the Melech Shubachayas. The lion is the king of all of the, of all of the beasts. So he says, once, Reb Leib, the lion, got very, very upset at all the animals. Something happened and he was infuriated. And the king got into a very, very bad and stressed out, anxious mood. And all the animals were petrified because if the lion is angry, you know, who knows what's next. Their lives are in mortal danger. So they made a meeting, a summit, to figure out what they can do to assuage the anger of the lion. 
So the fox, yeah, the fox, let's call him uh, Mr. Fox or Rabbi Fox, Rabbi Fox, is always the Shua, the Gemara says in Brachas, is Pikeach Shabachi Pchayas. You know, he's the sly one. The foxes are shrewd. If you know how they. Uh, they uh, get their they, they, their prey. They're they're very shrewd foxes. That's why the Gemara says they 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 pick they pick him. They have this with this this wiliness, this shrewdness, sharpness. So the Shuol says, "Don't worry, I have in my repertoire three hundred beautiful stories and anecdotes and metaphors. I'll go to we'll go to the lion and I'll start presenting my stories, and he's going to melt." And he's going to get into a good mood and everything will be good. Okay, beautiful. So the animals start a procession to go to the lion. On the way, the fox turns to Bedala, to the Bedala, to the beer. And he says, Oy vavoy, I forgot a hundred, a hundred of my anecdotes I forgot. And the Bedala tells him, no, you still have two hundred. There will be enough to entertain the lion. So they continue the procession. They're getting closer. He turns to the wolf, Reb Wolf, the wolf. And if Rabbi Fox says to the wolf, you won't believe it, I forgot another hundred of my uh, parables and anecdotes. Oy va voy, what's going to be now? He says, but you know what? You still remember a hundred is good. They come much closer, and now they're already approaching the lion's den, and the lion sees all these animals, and he's furious. So he, the crouching lion gets up, and emits his roar, you know, Aryeh Shag Mila Yira, and they're all there, and the fox turns to the Bhershala, Reb Tzvi Hirsh, the deer, and he says, you won't believe what happened. I forgot the last hundred of the anecdotes. <laughs> I'm left with nothing. I'm gone. So the animals are now all <laughs> sobbing and weeping. The fox says, I guess what you got to do now is everybody's on their own. <laughs> Each one of you Go over to the lion and talk to him and figure things out. So the Baal Tov said, <laughs> that's a sharp word, that the Chazonim and the Rabbonim are like the foxes. <laughs> they say, we have all the anecdotes. We have the songs, we have the stories, we have the sermons. We have all the good information to inspire you and we'll represent you. He says, at some point, the fox doesn't know anything. At some point, stop relying on the fox. Go over yourself. <laughs> And to create your own relationship. Because very often we rely on other people's relationships. Other people will inspire me. Other people will ignite my heart. Other people will say it best for me. It's good to have foxes that can lead, but only to begin the procession. Ultimately, when it comes to the bottom line, he says, listen, I can't do it for you. You got to meet your own soul. You have to meet your own creator. You got to meet your own heart. But sometimes people think, Mi ani umani. Well, the fox is a hush of a person. He could go meet the king. He has what to say. I don't have what to say. I can't even say, Even that's <laughs> above me. Who am I to say? I don't have anything. Comes the Balatanya and says, You have to know that Tisha comes after a whole Elul. And the whole Elul, Hashem shows up wherever you are. Wherever you're hiking in life, wherever you're hiking in life, the Melech Malche Amlochim, the ultimate king and the ultimate queen is right there. And even if they're not dressed in the full majestic garments, it doesn't take away, it's the same presence. And even if I don't feel and I don't recognize that right here is the queen herself, the majesty herself, I think I have to talk to somebody else, it doesn't take away the reality. You should know the truth, that Hashem is right with you. And if you want him to take a picture of you, <laughs> you can give him the camera and he'll take a picture of you and he'll have a laugh and nothing is below his dignity and therefore nothing is below your dignity. And you don't have to rely on anybody else. It's a direct and intimate relationship that every single person and every single Jew has. You could meet him, meet the Shechina face to face in the most real and authentic way. They tell an old anecdote that there was an opera singer, and he did a beautiful rendition of Psalm chapter 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Mizmer Ladavid Hashem Roi Beautiful, something stunning. And people were so moved and amazed by the talent. When he finished, they gave him a standing ovation. 
there was an old Jew there, an Altayid, and he gets up and he says, do you mind if I do my rendition of Psalm chapter 23, Tehillim, Kapitel, Chav, Gimel, Mizmel, Adavid, Hashem, Royal, Ayaksa, the Lord is my shepherd, I'm not missing anything, I shall not want. So the opera singer says, go ahead. Problem is that this old man couldn't carry a tune to save his life. He also had a broken voice, and he also barely knew the words. So he got up to sing, and from a musical perspective, it was quite a disaster. However, he was a Jew filled, filled with Yerushalayim. He was a Jew filled with emotion, and filled with a spiritual connection, and filled with faith. He had a very deep experience, experiential relationship with Rabbi Nishalayim. So when he said it, he said it with all his heart, with all his soul. And people hear him saying, Kapitel Chav Gimel, chapter 23, Psalms 23, they began crying. When he finished, there was not a dry ear in the audience, a dry eye in the audience. <laughs> there was not a dry eye in the audience. So the opera singer felt a little insulted. He turns to me and says, I don't understand. I did a beautiful, flawless, perfect rendition of the song. I got an applause, a standing ovation, but nobody shed a tear. <laughs> you, you violated every law in the book. The music was off tune. The words were broken. The voice was horrific. Everybody was crying. What's the difference? And the old man looks up and he says, I'll tell you the difference. You may know the psalm, but I know the shepherd. So during these days, we bless, I bless you, we bless each other. That you should, we should be able to seize the opportunity and realize without fanfare and without drama, without drama, Rachmana, Liba, Boy, like the story I told this week with the Baal Shem Tov, Kukuriku, there was, Baal Shem Tov was once davening Yom Kippur. And the Talmidim, the students saw in Mezhebush, they saw that his face grew very, very serious. And he was a very intense, and they understood that something is, is happening, the Baal Shem Tov senses something, and it's not positive. So his students, the Chavrai Kaddish, increased their davening with more kavana, with more intention, with more passion, with more islavas, with more meditation. And as the day was progressing, the Baal Shem Tov's, uh, the Baal Shem Tov's composure was growing more somber and more somber and more intense and more serious. And they didn't know what to do, and people were very, very stirred emotionally. And it was already coming close to Neil, and the Baal Shem Tov was still so, so serious. There was a Jewish kid, a Jewish young boy, who came to daven. Now, he was an orphan, and he grew up in a farm. He was a farm boy. So he never had an education. He never learned olive bays. He never learned how to read. He was illiterate. Not only did he not understand Hebrew, he couldn't even read olive bays. And he comes to shul, and he's inspired. He's, he, he's aroused with passion. But he, does, he looks at a machza. He doesn't know which way to hold it. He doesn't know how to read it. He doesn't know which, what to read, what not to read. He can't read anything. You know, you imagine you read, uh, you see, uh, you I don't know, your place, and there's a book in, in Mandarin. You don't know what to do with it. He couldn't say a word. But he wanted to say something. So what did he do? He grew up with chickens and roosters. So he decided he's going to daven in the language of the kids, chicken and the roosters, because that's what he knew. So he started to scream, Kukuriko, 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 Kukuriko. So the gaba in the shul, what does a good gaba do? Yeah? Arois, arois, shake it, arois. Out of here. <laughs> they come to schlep out the kid, and he's screaming, I didn't grow up on a farm, so I don't know Mama how to do it, but you get the point. And uh, they wanted to schlep him out. He's disturbing home. The Baal Shem Tev, suddenly his face grew radiant with such joy. And he turned around and he motioned that they should leave. They should leave the farm boy there and that he should be able to continue his, uh, his prayers. And the Baal Shem Tev later at night said that this boy is Kukuriku nullified all of the harshness. It nullified all of the toxicity. It nullified all of the negativity. Why? Because it came from the core of his heart. Everybody has a kukuriku. Everybody has your own kukuriku. It's your own pain, your own truth, your own authenticity. It's not sophisticated. It's not lang it doesn't have a lot of language. It doesn't have maybe a lot of logic and intellect to it. But it's your own truth. So the Baal Shem Tov says, the Fak says, I'm out of here. Go, give your own kukiriku. Express yourself. Embrace it. And you're right here. Hashem is right, right here with you. L'chaim, l'chaim.
That's the Chavak, this chair, that's the Chavak of Israel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
It's a word in Pasuk from Yirmiyo Anavi. He says, pour out your heart like water. Water flows smoothly. Water flows easily. Unless you stop the water, you uh, contain the water, you block the water, you create a dam. The water just goes, a gate, right? It's a flist, as they say in Yiddish, it flows. So Shivchi Chamayim Libech, he says, that's your heart should be like water, it should flow. For some of us it's difficult. We have learned to use our brains instead of our hearts. Right? It's a Jewish thing. Why? Because to feel could be very painful. If life is painful and life is painful, it's hard to feel. It's hard. So at a very young age we learn to process everything in a cerebral way because the brain is safe you know you could look what yeah what not how to respond how to react and we often lose that ability to experience life emotionally because the experience of life is not intellectual the experience of life is is with the hearts with the hearts you know the Balatanya the Alter Rebbe after the Mizrach Magad passed away he became a Talmud of Reb Mendel Horodoker, Reb Menachem Mendel of Horodok. He's also known as Reb Mendel of Itepska. 
He's the author of the Sefer Pri Haaretz, Reb Mendel of Itepske, Reb Menachem Mendel of Haredok. So once he went for him to him Rosh Hashanah. They David Rosh Hashanah, Maidiv, and then the, all the students came to the house of Reb Mendel where they had a Suda of Rosh Hashanah together with his family. And Reb Mendel, he held the Balatanya in very, very high esteem, and he looks around before Kiddush, and he sees he's not there. So he asks, who is it? Where is he? He said, he didn't show up yet. So he sent somebody to go to Shul and see where he is. So the person goes to Shul and comes back, says, David noch. He's still davening, the Mairev of Rosh Hashanah. So he waits a little while, he still didn't show up. So he sent somebody else, a daven, he's still davening. <laughs> he didn't want to start the meal without him, out of respect, so he went himself. So the Mendel had a duck, he left the house, and he went back to Shul to check on the Balatanya. He came back, and he said these words. He said, and freed sich mit dem Eberstein, und der Eberstein freed sich mit dem. He's, 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 he's dancing with God, and God is dancing with him. <laughs> and he made Kiddush without him. The experience of Yiddishkeit, of life, is with the heart. There was a chassid I knew, his name was Reb Mendel Futafas. He was in the Gulag by Stalin for, I think, nine years. And he went through a tremendous amount in life. He suffered terribly. But he came out and he made it to England, to Israel, and then to America. So he once shared a story that uh, in his youth in Russia, he knew a Yid who was a Chassid from the Rebbe Maharash. The Rebbe Maharash was the fourth Lubavitch Rebbe, the son of the Tzemach Tzedek, Rebbe Shmuel of Lubavitch. And he said, this Jew was a simple Jew. He was an Ish Pashat, he was a simple Jew. When he davened, there was such a fire in his davening. So he once asked him, where do you get this inspiration from? So the Jew told him that he was once by his Rebbe, the Marash, the Rebbe Marash. And he told him that when he davens, he doesn't feel anything. Like, what is he supposed to He doesn't feel anything. So the Rebbe opened up his kapota, his bekeshe, his sartuk, his black coat. And then he opened up his shirt. <laughs> and then he removed his undergarment and he pointed to his physical heart. And he said to this man, he said, Rachmana libe boy. Hashem wants the heart, and he pointed to his heart, and he said these words, Di Herzala, to Di Herzala, this heart, this heart, this is what he wants, this heart. And that's what he told him, and this Jew said, and with that I'm davening till today. What did he do? He could have said the heart, what did he have to open up, his, his coat and his shirt? And the answer is, because a heart is all about the visceral experience, the physical experience, not an intellectual heart. It's, it's the heartbeat. It's, it's feeling the heartbeat. But it's hard for many of us. We say in the Slichus again and again, What does that mean? Bring us back so we will come back. Renew our days. What's Kekedem? What's Kekedem? How do you translate Kekedem? You know English. Huh? Like the days of old. So somebody sent me an email and said, which days of old do we want to go back to? They were all miserable. Which days of old? Give me the time in history that I should go back to say today. Wow, unbelievable. When? Tedach? Chanoich? Mesushelach? Before the marble? After the marble? Maybe for, for half an hour when Adam and Chava didn't eat from the tree. How long did it take? Huh? Which days of old? Which day, so somebody wrote me a whole email. They went through all of history. They want to know which days of old do we want to go back to? <laughs> before the First World War, before the Second World War. Rabbi Tzia, which days of old? Huh? Welche, welche days? Galicia? In the Heim, the Alta Heim, yeah? The Alta Heim. Yeah? How good was it? Chadish Yemenu Kekadim. Not a bad question. But here's one interpretation that's brought. Chadish Yemenu Kedem is, the word Kedem doesn't only mean like the good old days. <laughs> Kedem means, the word Kedem means before. Before. Kedem is the primal state before. Before what? Chadish Yemenu Kedem. And the answer is, like we learned this morning in the Maimer from the Balatanya, the Kutatayu Shiramalus Mimamakim on Rosh Hashanah. Kedem means everyone has a Kedem. There is your own primal state of being, which is absolutely amazing and beautiful. 
but it gets covered over with life's experiences and disappointments. And especially for those of you sitting in the room, whom I know personally have been through some really, really dark experiences, and it covers over your own kekeda. And what happens is we lose our chadesh, the creativity. We're basically living in coping mechanisms. We cope, we survive. So we say, Chadesh Yameinu Kekedem. Allow me to go back to my state of being pre-everything. Pre the, with the distortions, pre those thoughts and belief systems that made me start feeling that I can't trust anybody in the world. That made me start feeling that ultimately I'm judged and I will never, ever, ever not be judged. Take me back to the Kekedem where my inner child was completely free and courageous and compassionate and caring and curious and creative and connected completely. Chadesh Yemenu, because it's always there. It's not that it disappears. It could never, ever disappear. We learned today in the Maim Shea Amalish and Balatanya, he says that when it says in Torah, Karis, a person gets Karis, gets cut off if they do some terrible things, the 36 things we spoke about. It's only in the state of Yaakov of the soul. Meaning, it's the way the soul is experienced in my consciousness. But in the Nekud of Yisrael of the soul, he says, There's a state of being where the oneness with infinity is absolute and unequivocal and could never be tarnished and tainted. You can't be separated. You can't be disconnected. And nobody, not even yourself, and certainly nobody outside of you, can snuff out that part of you. So, Chadesh, Yameinu Kekedem, to your own Kekedem to your own internal uninhibited freedom where there is no self-judgment, where there is absolute uh, a, a caring and connection. And really that's what it means, Truvet Filots Daka. We speak about Truvet Filots Daka. What are these three things? Truva means return. Tfila, the word Tfila means davening, but it really comes from the word Naftule Eloikim Niftalti, which means connection. Or ha-toifel klei cheres, if you put together earthenware shards, toifel tefillah's connection. And stucker, we know what stucker is, charity, giving. So what are these three things? The first thing in life is tshuva. I have to be able to restore myself. I have to be able to return. To return to what? To return to the true, true, true me. And it takes courage. It takes courage, first of all, to believe that exists, that it exists. And second of all, to embrace it, to really be able to go back there. Sometimes we need tools, we need help, we need exercises, we need support. That's number one. But then there's a deeper level afterwards. Tefillah. Tefillah is to be able to connect all my parts together. To be able to see my life not as going in a hundred different directions with different conflicts. To really be able to connect all the parts and realize that all the parts in me really are not bad. The Gemara, the Gemara, the Mishnah says, You should love Hashem even with the Yetzirah. If the Yetzirah is so bad, how can you love Hashem? The Pshat is, like we had in the last women's class, I told us Yaakov Yosef says, the Yetzirah at the surface is bad. But deep down, you don't have any bad parts. Somebody told me today, and I think it's a very deep word. They told me, you know, during the Holocaust, six million Jews were killed. I'll tell you something else that was killed. The Yitzhahara was killed. The Yitzhahara was also killed during the Holocaust. It's true. When you look at Jews today, you don't see Yitzhahara anymore. You see brokenness. You don't see Yitzhahara. You see brokenness. Part of what was killed was also the evil, the negativity, the Yitzhahara. That's why if you want to touch people today, see their goodness. And you have to be able to see your own goodness. And even the parts in me that are not good, they're not really, really bad. They're trying to protect. I don't know one person, if you look into your bad parts and you look a little deeper, you'll see you're just trying to protect yourself. You're trying to survive from your own internal korban and holocaust. So you have to be able to connect all your parts and only through compassion, only through compassion. Balatanya writes, it's one of those, such a beautiful word. He says, in the morning we say, 
Avinu of Arachamon Hamirachim, Rachim no Aleinu, the same Belibenu Bina, Lahavin, Ulahaske, Lishmaya, Lilma de Lalamed, right? Literally, it means Hashem, have compassion on us so we can understand, we can listen, we can perceive. He says, no, it's one thing. Only with compassion can you have understanding. Avinu of Arachman, Amarachim, Rachim no Aleinu, so the Kabiva same Belibenu Bina. If you come from a place of terrible judgment, there's no understanding. You can't understand because everything becomes defensive. So I want to bless and encourage everybody this year, have compassion. Have compassion on yourself. Have compassion on all your parts. Have compassion, therefore, on others also. And you know what happens when you have compassion? You can actually see reality. The same Belibenu Bina. You understand what I'm saying, guys? Well, not really. When you have compassion, you can actually see reality. When you don't have compassion, you don't see reality. You're blocked. You're blocked. So tshuva is going back to the core. Tefillah is connecting all the parts. And then you become a giver. Then you become, because really by nature, we all want to give. You don't have to create love in people. You don't have to create compassion in people. People are not selfish. The tzelem alakim, Hashem gives, we want to give. But if I'm surviving, how can I give? I can't give. I'm busy taking, 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 taking. I'm surviving. Once you do tshuva, you go back to your core, which is undamaged. And tefillah is you connect all your parts. And you realize that all the parts that are seemingly damaged are really also trying to protect you. And essentially, essentially, you can open them all up to your true core. You know what happens next? Taka. Then you give, and you give, and you give. But with, this can be done with judgment. Now you'll ask me, the whole Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur is Yom Adin. It's a day of judgment. I'm telling you, no, don't judge. Everybody's judging. So this is where we, I always think I said this a few years before Slichas. We don't mind being judged. The question is, who's judging me and how you're judging me? I don't like being judged because usually the people judging me, first of all, they don't know me. <laughs> that's the first thing they don't know me even if you do know me yeah how much do you love me and even if you love me do you forgive me but what happens if you could sit with somebody who first of all loves you infinitely their love is limitless they love you as much as you love yourself maybe more number two they forgive you you ever sat with somebody who forgives you they want you to fly they want you to succeed they want you to blossom. They want you to be the most successful person in history. They forgive. You know what forgive means? Fizakma forgive in English. There's no word in English. Ich forgive is dein Wort. Not to begrudge. Forgive. You really celebrate somebody's success, right? So if you're sitting with somebody, first of all, who loves you infinitely, second of all, who wants to see you blossom, and third of all, somebody who knows everything about you they know every struggle they know every disappointment they know every tear you shed they know every challenge they know every test not from the day you became mature but from the day you were conceived and then they say let's go through your life and i'm going to judge what are we going to judge first of all i'm going to give you a standing ovation for every victory for every time you woke up in the morning. That's also judgment. Yoim Adin doesn't mean I judge you how bad you are. I also judge you and I say, it's time for a standing ovation. That's what you get, a standing ovation. Now let's look at the weaknesses, at where you failed. And let's see how next year you could become more free, more emancipated. I ask you a question. Is there anybody you know who would not like to sit at the feet of such a presence who loves you infinitely? who wants to see you succeed infinitely and who knows everything about you and together you survey and you discern and you make a reckoning of all aspects of your life. We give a standing ovation for the successes and we ask how we can repair. That's beautiful. That's the type of din that we ought to celebrate, that we ought to cherish. It's one that that, that celebrates your beauty, the tshuva, the tefillah, the tzedakah. So may this year be a year of chadesh yameinu kekedem, where each of us can really find our deepest creativity, our chiddush, in the kekedem, in your pristine, splendid, sacred self. 
in your ultimate, truest, divine self, which is Echad Yachid in the Lashon of the Balatanya, in Shira Malus Amakim, Echad Yachid and Meyuchad in Hashem Yisbarich, Beli Shum Pirud Beshum Oifen, inseparable. Amen. Everybody, please join us.
Famous Madrash in Parshas uh, Mitzayra. It's in Vayikra, Perik Tazayan, Parsha Tazayan. The Madrash tells a very famous story. It's very hard to understand the story. That Rabbi Anai, Rabbi Anai was one of the great Talmudic sages. He lived, lived in the third century in the city of Tsipoiri. Tsipoiri in the upper Galilee in Eretz Yisrael was a very, very happening city. It was marketplaces and thoroughfares and many people, and it was a place of action, as you would say. And Rabbi Yannai was up in his chamber learning, and he heard this fellow going around and saying, who wants to buy Sam Chaim? He has a medicinal compound for life. If you want to live, you know, like today they sell things for you to become skinny, handsome, lose your addictions become attractive, become a man, become wealthy, become affluent. It's all with one, one, uh, one Sam Chayim, the promise of life. 
So Rabbi Yannai went down, and he sees everybody is gathering around this fellow. He says, I would love to find, to find that medicine. He says, my medicine is not for you. He says, I want it. So the Jew takes out a Sefer Tehillim, and he opens up the Tehillim, and he says, he shows the Pasuk, Mi yoyish ha-chafetz chayim, oyev yamam liris toyev. Who is the one, the man who chafetz chayim, he wants the medicine for life? Mitzor l'shoyin chameira, usfasecha medaber mirma, sur meira vasei toyev, bakesh shalom v'radfeyim. Guard your tongue from negativity, from toxicity, Protect your lips from speaking deceitfully, deceptively. Go away from negativity, engage in good, seek out peace and pursue it. So the Medr says, Omer Rabbi Yannai, Rabbi Yannai said, Kol yoma yoyisi koireyas aposik hazah. My whole life I read this posik. Velo yoyisi yoydeya heichanu poshet. But I didn't know how to explain it. Atche bo roichel until this peddler came, and he told me the meaning of the Pasuk. So all the commentators say, the guy didn't explain the Pasuk. <laughs> the guy didn't sit down and give, he was sell, he wants to sell a medicine. What's the medicine this Pasuk? And he says, call your mind, my whole life, I didn't understand it. Till this guy came and he said, he didn't say anything, he just repeated it. This is the Pshat. That sometimes to understand something, you don't need a person to explain it. You just need a person to say it. <laughs> but Rabbi could also say it. That sometimes you just need a person to say it. The person says it, you understand it. I, he said the same words like you said your whole life. But there's something about how he said it that makes it different. You know, they tell an old joke that there were three old men in Palm Beach, Florida. And they retired, and they would play golf every day till 2 o'clock. 2 o'clock they would sit down, and they would start drinking gin and play cards. And they would say jokes to each other. Now, how many Jewish jokes are there in the world? So basically, for my calculations, is around 400, right? 100 about doctors and lawyers. Another 100 about rabbis and mothers-in-law. Another 100 about uh, marriage and relationships. Another 100 about psychology and psychiatrists and therapists. That's basically the Jewish jokes. Rabbis, mothers-in-laws, wives, husbands, you know, health and so forth. So after many years, 20 years of saying jokes, they were recycling the jokes. So they decided, what do they have to say the joke? And everybody laughs. They'll give every joke a number. And you'll just say joke number 32, and everybody will laugh, so you don't have to say the whole joke. So this worked wonders. One day a fourth man joins them, and he sits down, and they're throwing out numbers. And he doesn't understand what's happening, and he feels left out. And he doesn't really understand. They're all laughing, and he doesn't know why. Number 33, they're laughing. So he wants to feel, you know, you like to feel part of the chevre. You don't want to be left out. So the next day, he decides he's going to take a risk, and he's going to throw out a number. And he's like, 92. Nobody laughs. Nobody laughs. So they say, he says to them, why aren't you laughing? They say, you have to know how to tell a joke. <laughs> so, lahavdil, you have to know how to say a pasuk. So I saw an unbelievable vart from Reb Tzaddik. Reb Tzaddik HaKoyen of Lublin. Somebody actually sent it to me a few days ago. A vart from Reb Tzaddik HaKoyen of Lublin. And he says, and I looked it up, this is what he says. He says, every Pasuk of Teira, every Pasuk of Teira, you have the Pasuk itself, but it could be dry. It could just be dry. It doesn't have its life. And then you have what's called Tame Teira. Tam, from the word tam, flavor, geschmack. That is somebody who can feel the tam and the mesikos. You know, something you could eat something, but it's tasteless. You don't feel the taste. You can hear something, but you don't feel the flavor in what the person is saying. So he says, Rabbi Yannai said the whole Pasuk constantly, but he never got it. He never felt the geschmack, the reichkeit. Why? Because sometimes you can hear the most amazing things, but if you're not ready for it, you don't hear the beauty. The beauty is there, but the beauty is hidden, and you just hear words. You don't hear the beauty of the words, the depth of the words, the richness of the words. We all know in life you can hear something, and then 10 years later, you hear it, and you hear it in a completely different fashion. Why? Not because the words changed, because you changed. Your experience of life 
opens you up. Everybody knows there's experiences in life that sometimes the same message you could have heard 10 years ago, it means nothing to you. 10 years later, you went through a roller coaster and now you hear it, wow, you never heard such an amazing thing. Why? The question is where you are, where you stand in life. So the Tzaddik says that he heard this directly from the Ishbitzer. He was a Tzaddik was a student of the Ishbitzer Rebbe, the Meha Shiloyach, Mordechai Yosef Liner. So he says, Shamati Me'arava Kaddish Me'ishbitzer. He says as follows, This butler, this butler, this called a Reichel. The mention he was a Reichel. The word Reichel, Rashi says, comes from the word Rechilos. I call him a butler, sorry, a peddler. This peddler, a peddler in Yiddish, or a peddler in English, Rashi says Rechil. What's Rechilus? Rechilus is, you go around, right? Also like a peddler. You sell this person a story, then you tell him a story, and then you sell Yankel a story and Schmetel a story. You're always selling stories about people. You're a peddler. Some people are peddlers with perfumes, and some people are peddlers with medicine. Some people are peddlers with mices, with gossip, with slander. So he says, this person is a Rechil. He says, he had this issue with, uh, you know, he was a gossiper. It was what's called Ayenta. He had stories about everybody, telling everybody stories about everybody else. He wasn't just a peddler in terms of finances. He was also a peddler in terms of his personality, in terms of his character. This is what type of person he was. So the Tzaddik says in the name of the Ishbitzer, when he did Shuva and he realized his mistake, Hirgish Tam Chudish So when he said this Pasik, he really felt the flavor of it because he went through the experience. So when Rabbi heard him say the Pasuk, he heard a different Pasuk. He felt the sweetness, the depth, the flavor of it. He says, Until you didn't stumble, until you didn't fail with it, you can't feel it. You know what it says, but to really get it, to really feel it, to experience the full splendor of it, he says, you have to, you have to have had experience. Yeah, if you didn't have experience with it, if I didn't fail in this area, like the Gemara says, you have to, you have to be able to experience it. And on this, he brings a fascinating pasuk. There's a pasuk in Mishlei, Perik Chafalaf, Proverbs chapter twenty-one. It says as follows: It says, "Oitzer nechmed v'shemen b'nevei chacham uksil adam yevalenu." which means sometimes you have a beautiful treasure in your house. For example, oil or other great things. So a smart person makes sure that he keeps the treasure in his residence. Even if he has to use it, he's very sensitive how much to use. But he says, a ksil adam, a person who's a fool, yivalenu, he'll swallow it all up. You know, you win the lottery and within five years, you're a beggar, you're a pauper. You don't know how to keep things. A ksil adam, a fool of a person, yivalenu, will swallow it up. So Tzaddik says in the name of the Ishbet said that it means something much deeper. He says as follows, very often in life, you have a beautiful treasure, but then you become a ksil, I become a fool, I do something foolish. I do something foolish, I make a mistake, I fail, I stumble in a particular area. And then he says, when you do tshuva, ah, then you vla'enu, then you really swallow it up, then it goes into you. Then this treasure is truly, truly internalized. You feel it in a different way. You know, when you swallow something up, it becomes internalized. He says, until I didn't do the foolish thing, I'll never really swallow it. It's going to remain a treasure of Tere Rabbi It was a treasure. Mi Yishach of Only Ksil Adam. When the person made a mistake, the person failed, and then he learns from it. Ah! Yivalenu. Then you really, it really becomes part of you. It becomes part of your gut. It becomes part of Yikishkas. And he says, and that's the beginning of Tere Shabal Peh and Tere Shabiksav. Tere Shabiksav is the written Tere. Tere Shabal Peh, that's the, the Tame Tere, the depth of Tere, the, 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 the Gishmak of Tere, what's inside of Tere. So it's only I have to become a Ksil, I have to sometimes do foolish things in order for me to really be able to, to swallow the medicine, to really turn it into something that is mine. I think this gives a tremendous uh, source of empowerment for those of us, each one in our own way. Sometimes we go throughout life and we made mistakes. You make mistakes. What does tshuva mean? So sometimes we look at tshuva in a very negative sense. You know, you're bad, then you did bad things, and you're going to be punished and you better repent. But what he's teaching us here, what the great masters are teaching us is, it's actually much deeper than that. Like the Gemara says in Yumadaf Pevav, Rish Lakish said, 
That's doinus nasalei kezachis. When a person does tshuva out of love, the sins become mitzvahs. Which means every mistake I make, every foolish thing I did, becomes an opportunity to be able to swallow up elikus, godliness and goodness, in a much deeper way. Because precisely because I failed. So now when I grow from this experience, when I learn from this experience, my appreciation for the truth is so much deeper. I'm not only saying a posik, I'm living a posik. You know sometimes two people, one person says it, another person says it, but it's a different, it's a different experience. One person says it and it's dead. Another person says it and it comes to life. Why does it come to life? Because they feel it. So the Bianai says, my whole life, this ne- Pasuk never came to life. This peddler, this Reichel, this peddler taught me how to say the Pasuk. He didn't say anything new. Uh, but it was completely different. This can only happen because there was a Ksil. Ksil Adam Yevaleno. Because of his mistakes. Because of his failures. So whenever you look at life and you say, you know, this I could have done better, and this I missed the target, and here I missed an opportunity, and here I was out for lunch, and here I was out for breakfast, and here I was out for dinner, and some of us are out for all three meals. We believe in takeouts for all three meals. And here I didn't know how to be here in this situation. I didn't know how to be here in this situation. I was confused. I was overwhelmed. I was startled. I was drunk. I was shikid. I was ever bottle. I was blind. I was deaf. I was oblivious. I was detached. I was numb. More adjectives, huh? You get the point, yeah? Whatever it is, yeah? My soul was shattered. I was in too much pain. I was in too much too much survival mode. Whatever it is, I was disassociated. I was disconnected. It, it may be true. It may be true. But when you have compassion and you look at it, so it becomes a tremendous opportunity for Yivaleno to be able to appreciate the depth of what tshuva is, the depth of what life has to offer. And then it's a completely, completely different experience. There was once a woman I met, and she grew up in California in a very, very secular Jewish home. And she shared this with me directly. She was a very spiritual soul, and in the 60s, like many Jewish youth, she traveled the world to find spiritual enlightenment. And she was in Europe, and she was in the Far East, and not just for a few weeks, for years. I believe she spent a year or two in a monastery in Scotland. She spent a very long time in ashrams in India, in Tibet. And she was involved in all forms of Christianity, of Buddhism, Hinduism, Zen, Far Eastern disciplines. She fasted for months and was involved in meditations and burning of the incense, the to all of the deities that they have in the Far East literally for years involved in what you would call Avodah Zara. And then she got a call one day that her, her father was very ill, he was deathly ill. So she came back to America, she came to California, and it was Pesach time, and a friend asked her if she would like to join Pesach, to go for Pesach to Crown Heights, to the Jewish community there. This is 1973. She said, yeah, why not? So she went for Pesach to Crown Heights, and she spent there a public seder. There was a girl's public seder there, a place called Machon Khan. And the Lubavitcher Rebbe would come to visit the seder of different institutions, different public seders happening in the neighborhood before he went to his own seder. And she saw him and she was very moved. And she started to a search towards Yiddishkeit and she started to learn. And after a few months, she was very, very enthralled by the depth and the majesty of Yiddishkeit. And she decided to stay and learn much more. And after a while, she became closer and closer to Yiddishkeit and Torah Mitzvahs. And uh, she felt that she found her roots, she found her heritage, she found her soul. And as she was learning more, she started to feel horrible about the fact that she spent years in ashrams and monasteries with all types of gurus and priests and uh, spiritual leaders and was involved in a lot of idolatry. So she decided that she's going to write a letter to the Lubavitcher Rebbe and share everything that she experienced, everything. She told me it was like an eight-page letter. And she shared everything that happened in the last years of her life and every ritual she was involved in, everything she was engaged in. She did not you know, deny anything. And a few people told her that probably the Rebbe is going to give you a long tikkun 
It's going to tell you how to fix all these years. Maybe you'll fast for 40 years, maybe you'll fast for 20 years, you know, Monday, Thursday. But there's going to be a lot of tikkunim, a lot of way, things to fix all your mistakes. She told me that the Lubavitcher Rebbe got her letter, and then he responded to her, and he wrote to her back as follows, a letter back, an answer. And the crux of the letter was as follows. The Gemara says in Meseches Megillah, Davov, everybody knows, Yogati umotsasi tamen. If a person says, I worked hard, I searched hard, and I found, believe them. Lo yagati umotsasi al tamen. If you worked hard and you found, believe the person. So he wrote as follows. Since by you, the Yagati was already Mekuyim, so now Hashem is going to help that the Matsasi is also going to be fulfilled. Since you completely fulfilled the Yagati, the search and the quest and the toil was there, so now Hashem is going to allow there's going to be a Matsasi. You're going to find the truth and you're going to discover everything you have to discover. And she said she felt like three boulders came off her chest because the four or five years of Avodah Zarah, instead of to see it as the ultimate disaster of her life that destroyed her soul and now the rest of her life she has to fix it, it became a Yagati. It was all the final one. Yagati. She was searching. She was a Tinik Shanishba. She didn't grow up with Yiddishkeit. She was searching. She was searching everywhere. And she went on a search. It was a search. Yes, the search took her to places that are quite alien from Judaism. But it was part of her search. Her soul was searching for God wherever she can. It was part of her search. So he said, it was part of your agaiti. So now we'll be a matzase. The whole experience. And then I understood what the Gemara says. The Yishlakish says, Zdainis nasalek The sin suddenly becomes a mitzvah. Why? Because that essentially is redefined as the beginning of your growth. That allowed you, the downfall allowed you, and it became a catalyst for a new unprecedented awareness. So in life, as you go through the journeys of life, and we go through and we make a reckoning and people see, you know, this went wrong, that went wrong, whether it was my fault, it wasn't my fault, it was willingly, it was unwilling, you can also turn around your perspective and say, I don't have to be defensive. I don't have to counterattack. I can have compassion. And now I could say, Ah, Mia Isha Chafetz Chaim, Oyev Yamam Lidis Toiv. You rediscover yourself with a much, much greater depth to the point that every negative experience is now redefined. So Peladik Gemara and Menachas. The Gemara says in Menachas, Daf Memdala, that is, I think. There was a, it's a whole long story there. You remember the story? There was a Jew, and uh, he was. Uh, he was not involved in such nice things. He was involved in promiscuity. The Gemara says that he heard about a woman who was promiscuous, and he traveled to her, and he gave her a lot of money. And then the, two, the four tzitzis came, the tip alponov. He was careful in tzitzis, and suddenly the tzitzis were there. And at the end, he abstained. And uh, she said, what, 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 mum, what blemish did you find in me that you didn't want to get involved? And he told her, no blemish, but he spoke to her about tzitzis. And ultimately, she came, and she converted to Yiddishkeit, and their relationship was reignited. And the Gemara says, Oison Matzois, Shehitzia Loi Beisur, Hitzia Loi Beheter. The same mattresses, the same beds, the same, uh, the same, ah, um, huh? the same pallets, the same bedware, the Zelba Kolderas, the same blankets and sheets and mattresses and bedware, ah. Huh? And gold and silver, all it was very, very aristocratic that she offered to him in prohibition, she now offered to him in permissible. So I once heard from the Rebbe, he was a lot of and he said, What's Oysan Matsoyas? And if it was different ones, and if she ordered from Amazon, Amazon Prime new ones, no, Oysan Matsoyas was the same ones that she once offered in Isur, Oysan Matsoyas. What's the Oysan Matsoyas? And if it was not yet, so he said, That's the word of Tshuva. The very passion, the very gold and silver, the very mattresses that you will offer be'isr, that becomes itzi'alai be'at. In other words, the real power of tshuva is not just you run away, but you transform. The very creativity, the very passion that was involved in the isr, this doinus nasalai kazach, is why? Because you discover that that very downfall 
that very mistake becomes a springboard for awareness. It teaches you who you really are. They say that, uh, it's an interesting story, that in IBM there was a manager and he did, made a terrible mistake and he cost the company $10 million in losses. So the next day he went in and he gave his resignation papers to the, to the CEO and he said, you don't have to fire me. I'm resigning myself, so you don't have to pay me any severance pay. I wish I could pay back the $10 million, but I can't. So at least I'm going to leave. And I just so apologize. He was a good person. He made a horrible business mistake. And the boss looked at him and said, where are you going? He said, I'm resigning after what I did. He says, you're resigning? Are you crazy? I just spent $10 million on your education. <laughs> where are you resigning? When I make a mistake and it becomes a source of education, then the mistake may be the best thing I ever did in my life. <laughs> this man remained in the company and he was, loyalty was unbelievable because you can't buy such loyalty. So when I make a mistake, if that mistake becomes a, a, a catalyst, a yisoid, a tashtit, a foundation for, for growth, for awareness, aha, then it may be the best thing. That's the Pshad's Dainus Nasa like his is. So this is what the Pshadik says in the name of the Ishbitzer. That that Reichel, sometimes you have to hear the Pasik from that person. Only he can really, really understand that Pasik. So when you look at your life and you see those things that were missing and those things that you're upset about and those things that you regret, don't only say, no more. Go much deeper than that and say, ah, now I can have a real Gishmak in this. Now, when you rectify it, you transform yourself from it, you can have something much deeper. Oh, you're 
It's an old story about a Jew who he was a simple Jew and he owned what they used to call a kretschma. You know what a kretschma is? An inn, a tavern, like a Motel 6 in Poland, in Galicia, in Russia. They had these inns on the road that the Jews would rent out. They would lease it from a paritz. A paritz was like a squire, an overlord, who was usually uh, <laughs> not a very righteous person, but he had all these properties. And a Jew, they used to call them Moshka. They called them Moshka, Moshe Moshka. That was like the nickname. And they would rent out, huh? Yeah, and they would rent out these kretschmas, these inns, and people would come and have a drink there and sleep there and get some food. And they had to pay an annual rent to the pirates, to the squire, and this is how life went on for many years. They say there was a Jew, and it was a stormy winter with a heavy snow, so there were not many visitors, because there were not many travelers, because of the terrible situation on the roads, nobody could travel. So the Jew didn't make an income to be able to pay the rent. When it came time to pay the rent for the year, he went to the parrots, he went to the squire, and he asked him if he could pay him the next year because it was such a bad winter. He doesn't have the money. So the person was not happy, the squire wasn't happy, the parrots, the overlord, but he said, okay, in my compassion, I'll wait for another year. Yeah. Problem is that the next year was also a very difficult winter, and he barely had the revenue, he couldn't even pay for that year, never mind for two years. And he realized that if this year he doesn't have the money, the guy couldn't kill us. They had so much power, he could take him and his family and throw him into a dungeon, throw him into prison, he could beat him. It was not very, uh, it was a very difficult situation. So he realized to save himself and his family, he has to make a vayivrach, he has to escape. He has to escape, there's no choice, he has to escape to a different territory where this man has no authority and start his life anew, but there's no other choice if he doesn't want to end up in a dungeon. So one day he takes up, he takes his bags and his belongings, he packs it up on his wagon, takes his wife and his children, and they escape town. As they go out of town on the road, taking them to another town, he sees a coach, a beautiful coach, coming against him the other direction. Who is it? It's the Pirates. Pirates happen to be in his coach, going out, and he sees this Jew, his Moshka, with all of his belongings packed into the wagon with his wife and children. He says, right? Not in Hebrew, but uh, where are you heading? And the Jew realizes it's a difficult situation. So he says that there's a Yom Tif. Tomorrow's a big Yom Tif. It's a big holiday. And you know we don't have a community where I am. So for the big holidays, I always go to another city where there's a lot of Jews. I could celebrate the Chag, the Yom Tif, with the, my brothers. So he says, really? Interesting. What Yom Tov? I know Pesach, I know Shavuos, I know Sukkot, I know Chanukah, I know Purim. I never heard of this holiday. What Yom Tov is it? What's the name? So the Jew says the name of this Yom Tov is Chag Pleitosenu. <laughs> the holiday of our running away, of our escape. That's the name. On the spot, not bad, right? Chag Pleitosenu. The name of our escape, the holiday of our escape. So uh, the part is interesting. You learn new things. Okay, enjoy the holiday. But remember, you come back. I need money for two years. No, the Jew leaves Baruch Shapatrani, and he goes on to his continuous escape. The next day, the part is traveling, and he sees a Jew working his farm. So he stops. He says, "I don't understand. It's a holiday today. It's a chag. Why are you working your farm?" The Jew looks at him and says, who told you it's a holiday? He says, Moshka. Moshka told me that this is a Yom Tif. So this Jew wasn't dumb. He understood. Yesh Dvarim Begay. He says, did he tell you the name of the holiday? Of course. Chag Pleitoseinu. So he says, why don't you honor the holiday? What happened to you? 
So this Jew also wasn't dumb. He says, let me tell you, this holiday is different than all the other holidays. This holiday, every Jew celebrates on his own personal date. He figures out when is the time for his own Chag Pledas. And other holidays, there's a date for everybody. Tesvav Nisan, Tesvav Tishne. But Chag Pledas is an individual. <laughs> it's an individual holiday. You figure out the date that works for you, and then you run away. He says, ah, okay, now I understand. Why Mushka is celebrating it today, and not uh, and not anybody else? No. This is the time of the year, yeah, with all the Chag Plato say no, right? <laughs> the time when people feel like they could and they want to run away from things that bother us, from things that hurt us, from things that trouble us, from things that keep us down, from negativity in life, whatever it is. Every person, according to his own Chag Plato, say no. But we often see, as far as you try to run away, it follows you. It's, uh, so the question is, how do you create a Chag Plato say no? <laughs> how does a person, sometimes when you flee, if you're fleeing yourself, you can't escape. Because you come with. <laughs> so if I'm escaping from something, it looks like I'm escaping it, but it's really inside of me. It's extremely hard to escape. And that's why you see, comes El Tishrei, people say, this year, I'm running away from this. I'm not going to do it anymore. And suddenly, you know, a few months later, the same place, and sometimes even worse, because it comes back with a vengeance. If you don't know how to run away from something, it comes back even stronger. How does one, how does one really create a Chag plate, a Seno, that's individual? It's not just collective, it's, it's individual. And I think one of the, the main points, and it's, I think, sometimes a mistake that we make. <clears throat> There's a beautiful, beautiful word from the Helika Baditshiva. You know, it's one of those insights you see from him and you're like, ah! The Helika of Yitzhak of Baditshiv, he loved people. And he loved Jews. He's known as the Ay, and all, everybody knows he's the Ay of Yisrael. So, yeah, but Levitzchev Lev of Baditshiv has a safe called Ktusha Slevi. The holiness of Levi. His name was Levi. And in the back, there's a section called Likutim. And he has their different teachings on different Gemaras. So, this is a has a teaching on a Gemara in Meseches Baba Metziah. Baba Metziah Dav Pedalid, on Medalev, the Gemara tells a story. Rabbi Yochanan was unbelievably beautiful. And he was bathing in the Jordan River. And Rishlakish was a bandit. Rishlakish was uh, he was in a group of gangsters and bandits and thugs and robbers and gladiators and he was very powerful and he sort of yoichanan and he decided to behave in an inappropriate way and he jumped into the jordan river he jumped into the jordan river and the saw this person's power and he said famously two words right he could have said to Ferd, Ganev, Gazlan, Russia, Marusha, get out of here, yeah? Rabbi Yechon said two words, Chelach, Loi Raisa. Such strength belongs to Torah. Yishlakish wasn't, uh, wasn't, uh, <laughs> he wasn't shy. So he told Rabbi Yechon, and Shufrach Lenoshim. Such beauty belongs to women. <laughs> Rabbi Yechon was saying, with your strength, ah! how much tighter they can be. And he said, with your beauty, I don't know what you're doing in the base Medrash. You could do much better for yourself. So Rabbi Yechanan said, you think I'm beautiful, my sister is more beautiful. And if you turn around your life, I'll suggest to my sister to marry you. Talk about believing in people. <laughs> how could Rabbi Yechanan do that to his sister? <laughs> Rabbi Yechanan do that to his sister. And Rabbi Yechanan said, I'm in. Rabbi said, I'm in. I once gave a shit. I said, Rishlokr changed his life in 20 seconds from such a conversation. The answer is when Rishlokr saw how much Rabbi Yechenim believed in him. He's ready to make him, give him a sister? I don't understand. That's, he realized Rabbi Yechenim doesn't join. Rabbi Yechenim wasn't just being a nice Kirov guy, you know. He's uh, running a Chabad house in the Jordan River. Chabad of the Jordan River. You have to be nice to people. Why not? Rabbi Yechenon believed in him. He's going to become Mishpacha. Rabbi Yechenon was aristocracy. The editor of Talmud Yerushalmi, you take a look and says, you're shvager. Yeah, you'll give him a place in shul. You'll give him a little cholent. You'll be nice to him and give him an aliyah. Rabbi saw how much faith Rabbi Yechenon had in him. 
he started to believe in himself. And he transformed his life, and Ishlakish became his brother-in-law, and he also became one of the G'dayli Adar, one of the greatest of the generations. One of the greatest of the generation. You learn Gemara, Rabbi Yochan and Rishlokish are always arguing and disputing, and they were the two Chachmei Atalmud of the greatest of that time. The Gemara continues to tell a story that it was once talking in the Beis Medrash about weapons. What's considered for, for a keli, for a, a vessel to be makabal tumma, to be susceptible to tumma, it has to be complete. If it's still being made, it's not a complete vessel, it's not susceptible to tumma. Let's say a sheritz falls into it, a dead weasel, it does not tell me because it's not, it's not a vessel yet. Just like if it breaks, it's not makabal tumma. The question is what's considered gemar malacha, a sword, a dagger, a spear, a knife, the Mishnah the Gemara brings there all different cases, a cherev, a roimach, a sakim. So Rabbi Yechanan says, Mishi Yitzarfei B'Kivshan. You have to take it and put it in the furnace and mold it and refine it in the furnace and then it's done and now it's Mechabal Tumah. Yishlokish says, no, 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 Mishi Yitzach Tzachoi B'Mayim. After you take it out of the furnace, you have to polish it in the water. And then it really becomes consolidated, now it's a weapon, now it's Mechabal Tumah. So when Rabbi Yechanan heard that, he said, Listim belistuse yada. A robber knows his business. A thug, a bandit knows his business. He knows when weapons are ready. That's what he tells the Shlakish in the Bismetzish. A listim belistu. He knows his business. He knows how to make a sword, how to make a dagger, how to make a spear. This is his business. He works with F-16s and drones and bombs and grenades and swords, etc. Rishlakish heard this. So he tells Rabbi Yochanan, my Hanoi, what do I need you for? What did you do for me? Before that they called me Rebbe, the Achshav Koyim Li Rebbe. When I was by them, by the Listim, they also called me a Rebbe. I was the chief. I was the Rebbe. Rashi says he was Reish HaListim. He was the head of the Mafia. Rishlakish was a very powerful person. And now they call me Rebbe. So what did you help me? I was a Rebbe before, and I'm a Rebbe now. In other words, what's the story of Gita? What do you do for me? So the Shlokish says, What do you mean? My, my, I brought you under the wings of the Shechina before you were a Rebbe by the thugs. And now you're a Rebbe in Klai Yisrael. I brought you to the Shechina. What do you mean? What did I do for you? And as a result of that, Rabbi Yochanan felt horrible and the Shlokish fell ill. The Gemara continues the story. So the Levitzik of Badichev says, he said, I don't understand. How does Rish Lakish say to Rabbi Yochanan, what you do for me? You did nothing for me. Before that I was a Rebbe, and this I was a Rebbe. The Badit says, Eich yachal gadol ha'olam. He calls Rish Lakish gadol ha'olam. Such a great person of the world. Speak like this. He really felt Rabbi Yochanan did nothing for him. I don't understand. It's the same thing being a Rebbe by the mafia. Being a Rebbe by the gangsters. Being a Rebbe by the gladiators, by the bandits of being a Rebbe. In, in the in the base medrash, <laughs> like Rishlokish really felt like I don't need you before I had honor, now I had honor. That's the whole thing of being a rebbe. He says, how did the god loyalim speak like this? And Rabbi Yochan had to tell him, no, look what I did for you. And what was he thinking? <laughs> he was one of the gedoli adar, and he said, you know what? I don't need you. I was a god before. I was the top of the mafia. So, but what the asks? So he gives the following explanation. He says, you have to understand the whole story in a much deeper way. He says, Rishlokish would have found his path back to the Rebbe Neshalel. He was a big person. He was a big Neshama. And a big soul finds its path. Rishlokish would have, without Rebbe Yechen, he would have found his path to Torah and to Mitzvahs. Because he had a very big Neshama. He was a profound person. He was a deep person. He wasn't just an empty lady gayer. He was a real person. But... But the way he would have become a Rebbe would be he would have been a Rebbe with a sword. He would have been a Rebbe with a dagger. He would have been a Rebbe with a spear. And the Baditshiva says you have teachers, you have masters, but they're filled with negativity. They're filled with swords. They stab people. They crush people. They break people. He says they're spiritual masters but it's done with tremendous harshness, with tremendous negativity. They put down people. They chastise people. They bring out, they show people how bad they are, how evil they are. 
and they try to stab their negativity. They mean well. They're trying to teach. But the way they do it is, the way they do it is, he says, it's but the list them. <laughs> That's what he says. It's a different derech. It's a different mahalach. I want to quote his words. He says, if not for the B'yayichanon, he would have become an Ayved Hashem. He was, had a mighty dik in the Shammah. But he would have been Kemidas HaGazlonim. His Avoidus Hashem would be like the thieves. Kas V'cheyme B'sina. would be full of anger to people. Full of wrath. And full of animosity towards negativity. And he would serve Hashem with these Midas to get angry at everybody that he thinks is bad. And everybody that's not serving Hashem. He would be full of anger. Came Rabbi Yochanan and said, No. Let me teach you how to be a Rebbe. You want to be a Rebbe, you have to, you have to pick up the world. Learn how to love people. Embrace people. Be peaceful. Be loving. So the Shlokish says to him, I would have been an Oivet Hashem without you. I don't need you. I didn't need you. Emes, I would have been B'midus HaGazlonim. I would have done it with my swords and with spears. He says, but I would still be a Rebbe through anger. So the Yechanan says, de I taught you how to be Mekarev people. Not I was Mekarev you. I taught you how to bring people closer. To educate the world through words of sweetness and a heart filled with goodness. And this you didn't have before. It reminded me of another word from the Baditshiver, also a beautiful word. He says it in Parsha Shoftim. Shoftim b'shoitim titim l'cha b'chol sh'orecha v'shoftu esha'om mishpat tzedek. You should have judges in all your gates, in all your cities, and they should judge people righteously. So the Baditshiver says Parsha Shoftim is always read in the month of Elul. It's read before Rosh Hashanah, Parsha Shoftim, in the weeks before Rosh Hashanah. So he says, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur is the time of judgment. The time of judgment. So he says, Hashem judges. So we also have to judge. And the way we judge is how Hashem judges. So the Pasuk says, In all your own gates, we have gates. Our own gates. Your mouth, your ears, your nose, those are the gates. Things come in and things come out. Make sure you have judges. And judge everybody favorably. Your judges that you appoint, when you judge people, judge them favorably. That becomes the vessel it's a Rusa de the arousal from below, that Hashem should judge you favorably. So Rabbi Yochanan was teaching Rish Lakish, there's two modes in Avodah Hashem. One is a mode in Avodah Hashem, you're serving God, but it's still, he calls it Midas HaGazlon, Midas HaGazlonim. Mida. It's still the, it's the art of listen. It's I'm walking around with a sword, right, with a spear. Vayikach <laughs> Reimach. You told me that he heard from Reb David Feinstein, Reb Moshe's son, Zechran Levracha. He said it says in Parshas Pinchas, in the Parshas Balak, Vayikach Roimach Biyadoi. Pinchas took a spear in his hand. He obviously took it in his hand. Where did he take it? In his foot? In his mouth? You take a spear in your hand. He says, the is like this. Some people, when they leave the house in the morning, they already take a spear and they put it in the bosom. Now they have to find a person to use it against. That's the time he picked up the spear. He wasn't, he wasn't walking around with a spear. They say uh, there was a Yid Reb Chaim Tzimmerman. Reb Chaim Tzimmerman was a big, big gun. He was from a uh, family of Reb Baruch Ber. He was a very big uh, literature. He was a gun. He was a genius. Reb Chaim Tzimmerman. So, uh, <laughs> so he had a neighbor. The neighbor shared the story. He said... Uh, in the morning, he saw the Chaim rushing out of his house. He says, Vu gate So he says, he's going to a meeting of a good Sarabonim. A meeting of a good Sarabonim. Psim Chalbeg, Rabbi Shafayin, she's not a good Sarabonim. He said, well, why are you rushing? He said, I have to put one of the Rabbonim in his place. <laughs> he says, who? He says, Mivetzen. <laughs> Mivetzen. <laughs> we'll see who. We'll see who. But Echtaf Emetzen, somebody have to put in their place. So you have a concept. He said it humorously. So you have the concept. Yeah. A person, <laughs> Rabbi Yechina was saying, you can walk around, I could be, be a Rebbe. But there's an element of negativity, there's an element of judgment. He says, I want to teach you how to do it. The way to do it is, you have to be able to have compassion. You have to be able to appreciate. You have to be able to see the goodness in people. You have to elevate people. 
How do you do this to other people? You do this to other people when you do this with yourself. Because if I don't know how to do it with myself, I don't know how to do it to other people. What you do inside your own heart, that's what we do to other people. That's what you do to your children. That's what you do to your spouse. That's what you do to your students. That's what you do to other people. So I think the Ketur HaBlev, it's about Ditchev is teaching us here how to escape things, how to celebrate Chag Pleito Seinu. If you run away from your negativity with swords and with knives, they usually follow you. So if you take a sword on a Shoshana Yom Kippur, you take a dagger and you're going to stab all your evil parts, yeah, they'll come back. Somebody once said, if you stare at the abyss, it starts staring back at you. When I go with this harshness, with this negativity, so they start fighting back. If you come to stab me, Chas Shalom, I'm going to fight back. Or I'll, I'll, I don't want to be connected to you. So the Kedusha Slavi is saying, you have to learn from Rabbi Yechanan. <laughs> what Rabbi Yechanan is teaching you is, don't run away from yourself with hatred. Don't run away from yourself with anger. Don't run away from yourself with wrath. You're not going to run away. It's going to run with you. The way to do it is run away from yourself with love. And that means you're not running away from yourself. Don't judge. Have compassion. Understand what's happening inside of you. That's tshuva, tefillah, tzedakah. You have to understand you don't have bad parts. You're not negative. You have to have compassion. Stop judging. Look at yourself with a deeper perspective. See what's happening. And have compassion. Rachim na'aleinu. And then v'seibu bino. bina. And then you'll be able to open yourself up and say, Ah, I can do it differently. I could do it in a much better way. Because essentially, what often happens in life is, we have so many different parts speaking in us. And they're very, very powerful. When you understand them and you can have compassion for them, you can understand them. And you can see what you really want and what you really need. And then you could be makariv all your parts. Instead of stabbing them and getting angry at them, be the makariv. Be nice to them. <laughs> Bring them in. That's how you do a chag pleta seinu. Let them run away together with you. Because then you don't have resistance. Then you're working with all the parts in you. You work with them. It doesn't mean you have to worship every temptation you have, but it means you have to have compassion and appreciate the struggle. And then you don't need to run from them. They run together with you. They're your partners. They're your allies. You understand what I'm saying? Everybody understands what I'm saying? You see the difference. You understand the difference in life. If you try it out, you'll see the difference. <laughs> you'll see the difference between the two mahalchem. One sounds much better, you know, fury and anger, and you have knives and chalafim, or meshechtzem et abracha, and that. You know the mice with Shmuel Munkus? Gewaldik. Shmuel Munkus was a Talmud of the Balatanya. And he was once traveling, and it was Shabbos before Slichus, and they had in towns different Magidim, different Magidim who would give Musr, they would give speeches. And they loved making everybody cry and feel miserable. This was their job, and they used to get money for it. So this Magid gets up, and he starts telling the people how bad they are, and Hashem is going to punish them, the women and the children. And he started to describe the punishments they're going to get because they're so sinful. And everybody was sobbing. The women were sobbing. The children were sobbing. The men were sobbing. And the man felt so good with himself. And the more they were crying, the better he felt because he was accomplishing his goals. Rabbi Shmuel Munkas was a real chassid of the Balatanyas. He didn't like this. So Mitzvah Shabbos, he went over to the person's hotel. And he says, your speech was amazing. And it's very obvious that you're pushed a tzaddik. You're like a tzaddik. And, and everybody is rishoyim. And he says, yeah, I hope you guys will do tshuva, not to get punished. You better do tshuva. So Shmuel Munkas says, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he takes out a chalif. He takes out a knife. The man says, what's this? He says, you know, I think part of the problem of our city is we don't have any tzaddikim in our cemetery. When we go daven, it's all Rishayim, our, our fathers, our mothers. And it says in Shulchan Aruch, you know, before the Shoshan, it's good to go to Kivrei Tzadikim, to your parents. It's brought in Paiskim to go to your parents, to go to Tchashav, holy people to pray and daven. And we don't have any Tzadikim. So he says, okay, so that's a problem. So he says, I thought, with a Tzadik like you, it would be beautiful if you could be in the Beis Achayim, in the cemetery by us, so we could start davening by you. And we'll be inspired and uplifted. And he comes closer with the with the with the knife with the chalif, and the guy says, "Sugar, you crazy?" Huh? He says, "No, no. I heard your speech. 
This is a city of Rishayim. We need a tzaddik like you. So he gives a scream. He says, Kabanishta's a tzaddik. I'm not such a tzaddik. He says, wow, not only are you a tzaddik, you're an un of two, you're humble too. You're the mamish the man in our cemetery. I see, I see the schusim of you in the cemetery. And he gets closer with the knife. He says, no, 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 I'm not humble. Shmuel says, why, why? He says, I sometimes do sins. He says, you? He says, yeah, Le Marshal. So the man says, I did this and this. He says, eh, that's nothing relative to our sins. You're a tzaddik. It's time to shecht. He says, no, no, I did worse sins. <laughs> he says, Le Marshal. So now he wanted to save himself. So he spilled the beans of everything he did. Shmuel Munka says, how do you have the chutzpah? <laughs> you get up here, innocent Jews, and you tell them how evil they are. Why don't you look in the mirror and see who you are? So, of course, he taught this Jew the lesson of his life. But it starts with others the way it starts with you. So, avoid this. You want real tshuva. Real tshuva is without hate even to yourself. Without hate even to yourself. We all have a Reish Lakish inside of us. Reish Lakish is Kivayachal, the bandit, the troublemaker. Reish Lakish is the kid who was thrown out of school, or maybe he stayed in school but did nothing. He's the boy who causes us all the challenges and all the problems. But you know what? He has a lot of power. And Rabbi Yechina looks at Reish Lakish in the first moment. He doesn't say, you're a sick kid. What does he say? Chelach loyreis. The first thing. He picks him up. I don't see your negativity. I see your power. And Ishlakish doesn't give in. He says, <laughs> I'm not part of your team. Your beauty goes to women. The Bechim is not, not afraid. I have, a, I have a sister who's more beautiful than me. And he transforms his life. He transforms his life. But in the transformation of his life, he teaches Ishlakish something. We all have a Yishlokish inside of us. And it's so powerful. It's so powerful. You could do two things. You could take a sword and fight your Yishlokish. And you know what? He'll fight you back. And your Chag play to say, no, it's not going to be so successful. Rabbi Yechinen says, throw down the swords. Come, let's become brothers-in-law. <laughs> let's, become, let's become best friends. Let's become close. Let me understand you. You'll understand me. You bring in Yishlokish with Kiruv. Bring in all your parts. Bring them in. Don't be afraid of them. Hashem Echad means that the Achdos of Hashem includes all of your parts. That's Tshuva. Tshuva is you go back to your core and then you see Tfila. You could connect everything. Everything is connected. And once you connect everything, then Staka. Then you want to give. Then you can give freely. You can give uninhibitedly. So I want to bless all of us that we should have the courage to be able to put down our swords, to put down our anger, and to be able to truly embrace ourselves. And then we can embrace others. And it's not so easy. It's easier said than done. Because we judge, we judge, we judge very harshly. And we call it Yoim Hadin. But the Baditshiva says it's Midas HaGazlonim. <laughs> I love those words. Oived es Hashem b'Midas HaGazlonim. He serves Hashem b'Via Gazlim b'Midas HaGazlonim. And it accomplishes much more. You know why? Because there's no resistance. Because everything becomes part of it.
But those who want, the Bioli has his famous Lishmoya El Arina Velatvila. It's going to begin at 1 o'clock. And here there's also going to be a minion for Slichus. Bezer Hashem at 1. Grace and Dank. Susamet Hatzlacha. Oiz Bet Nalaguta Zachem. Thank you so much for gracing us. You told me that his Zayda was by the Skvered Ebbe Shlita. 
So the Skvere Rebbe told them that it says in the Son of Toikif that Malachim, uh, Malachim Yechafezun, the Malachim are very, very intense. Chilur Ra'ado, they're filled with dread and fear. Why are the angels so afraid? The angels are, are good boys. They behave. The Malachim don't have what to worry about. They didn't make any trouble. Why are they so afraid? So he said the Malachim are afraid because they say, Maybe the Malachim feel that they did not they did not express the way they should have enough schusim. Be Malamut Schus, bring out the beauty and the positivity and the holiness in Jews. That's what they're afraid of. They're also going to be judged. Maybe they're walking around with too many swords instead of with smiles. That's what the Malachim are afraid of. Loyalty. Years go on, and the father starts making jokes with Moshe. He says, you know, you're not in my will. You're not in my will. I'm not putting you in my tzavok. He says, I asked my husband, could that be real? He says, knowing my father, yeah. Sure enough, one day his father calls him in. She says, my father calls in my husband, gives him an envelope, and says, here is my will. My tzavah, after I die, after 120, he opens it up, and he sees that everything he left only to him. He didn't leave a penny to push. Now this next... his brother Moshele. I think that's completely, completely wrong, but I'm going to do it anyway, and I know that my father, who's now in the oil of MS, wouldn't be so upset. I'm changing the will. <laughs> Since he gave everything over to me, <laughs> so now it's mine. <laughs> so now I'm going to do what I want. And he redoes a will, which is forged, in which the father split 50-50. 50% to Moishele and 50% to the other boy. And the father even wrote a note how much he loves both of his children and how proud he is of them and how much nachas and joy they gave him, and how much he's going to miss them and pray for them, and he hopes that this will help them a little bit, 50-50. <laughs> and then he calls up his brother Moshe, and he says, I found Tati's tzava. I found Tati's will. He says, really? Wow. He come over, takes it out, and she says, when I saw my brother-in-law Moshe reading the will, and I saw how he was crying from inner joy. I knew that my husband was right for doing it. He says, when I saw the two brothers hugging, Moshe, the first time, heard something positive from his father. I knew how right my husband was. And Moshe got 50%. He says, we didn't have money. So it was a very nice amount that we were giving up. But she said it was all worth it to keep the family together. She said, I saw at that moment my husband's dignity, and they said, my husband never shared with Moshe a thing till the day he died, until the day he died. The only one who knew about it was him and me, and the person who was a lawyer who helped him do it, and nobody else ever knew about it. And she says, my sister-in-law passed away, my brother-in-law passed away, my in-laws are gone, I'm also very old, but I wanted to share this story so that people should realize in life not to get drunk about external things and realize the value of relationships. And I share this story with you, my dear friends, because we live in a world and we live in a community where often there are rifts and people stop talking to each other and people get into fights with their brothers and with their sisters and with their brothers-in-law and sisters-in-law and with partners and with employers and with employees and neighbors. 
And sometimes they're right, sometimes they're wrong, sometimes they're 50% right, sometimes they're 90% right, sometimes they're 99% right, sometimes they're 1% right, whatever the situation is. But this is a time of year where we go deeper into ourselves and we realize that machloikas, disputations, don't make people thrive and happy in the deepest sense. And therefore, it's a time when you should encourage yourself not to be afraid, but to pick up a phone, to pick up a phone, to say I'm sorry, to apologize. And even, even, if you were the one who was wronged, and the other person is not right, you're the one who's right. But you will be much, much more content and much, much more fulfilled if you can get it off your chest and know that from your side, from your perspective, there's nobody that you don't speak to. How they react, that's their choice. Everyone has choices. But from your perspective, let it go. Let it go for yourself. Let it go for them. And how do you do it? It's scary. There's a part of your heart that says, no, 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 I can't, I can't, I can't. How do you do it? And the answer again is not with swords, only with compassion. There's a part of you that's scared to do it. There's a part of you that gets stubborn. There's a part of you that says, Sipasnish. there's a part of you that says, they're going to make fun of me. I'm going to be meek. I'm going to be stupid. I'm going to be a nerd. I'm going to be a loser. I'm gonna, it's going to be so humiliating and embarrassing. And what if the guy laughs me off? So that part is afraid. So comfort it, soothe it. It's a protector. They call it a protector. In Tanya, it's called a clipper. It's a shell. It's a husk. Soothe it, caress it, be nice to it, have compassion for it, and say, I get it. I understand. You want to keep me safe. You want to keep me strong. You don't want me to get hurt. I get it. I understand. Don't worry. I'm a big boy. I'm a big girl. I'm not three years old anymore. I can do it. You'll be fine, I'll protect you. And you'll see when you reach out and you create more peace, more love, more affection, more connection, your heart has more space. Your heart opens up. You live in a much better space. It doesn't mean you don't need boundaries. It doesn't mean everybody becomes your best friend. It doesn't mean some people don't shouldn't apologize to you. It doesn't mean any of that. And it doesn't mean you weren't hurt. And it doesn't mean some people are not petty and babyish. What it means that you are royal. You live in a place of malchus. You live in a place of expansiveness. You live with your chelik elekami mal. You live with your divinity. You don't get small. You don't get petty. You don't stoop down to levels of foolishness, of chitzonius, of externality. You want to live in a higher and deeper space. So this is the time of the year. Take a few minutes and reflect on those relationships that have been damaged, that have been wounded, sometimes it goes for weeks and months and years, and do you really, really need it in your life? And work with all your pieces, work with all your parts, connect them, bring them back to themselves, and then you'll find yourself being charitable and giving and generous and loving and kind. And when we create that, when we create that in our lives, we live in a much higher space. In a much healthier space you could speak with everybody you can embrace everybody you could say hi to everybody you don't live in grudges you don't have to live with chishboynes. you don't have anybody cut out of your life you're open again people's decisions is their decisions i can't tell all the people, what other people what to do but i could tell myself what to do with compassion and this is a tremendous a tremendous opportunity this time of the year to be able to let go of that living with, with, with resentment and anger and wrath. To put down the swords. And to create a sense of, of we, what we need is love and oneness and unity and a lack of judgmentalism. And I'll tell you the truth. It's also true on a communal level. You know, this is the era. This is a generation of, 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 of gula, of healing, of love. But, you know, they say old habits, right, die hard. And some people, it's hard for them to let go. So sometimes on a communal level also, we see that there's people that they want to, they sometimes, they have no choice. They feel that they're losing hold of things. So they want to create an atmosphere of judgmentalism. 
And if I could put you down, if I could put you down, if I could show that you're wrong, you're evil, you're horrible, then suddenly I'll feel like I'm a holy man, like Rabbi Yochanan told Rish Lakish. But we shouldn't be affected by that, because really what everybody wants, even those people, everybody wants love, everybody wants connection. So this is a time where we all should exemplify and embody that energy. Because when you embody that energy, it travels like crazy. You think the corona traveled fast from China to here? If the corona traveled so fast, love travels much faster. Because <laughs> love is light. Yeah? Oy. <clears throat> Vahafta, Begematria, Base Palm, and Murray, the Balshemtiv said. Light travels 186,000 miles per second. You know that? <laughs> so when you spread dark, when you spread light, it goes 186,000 miles per second. That's how fast light goes. The sun is eight light minutes away. It takes eight minutes for the sun's light to get it, 186,000 miles per second. There are stars that are 4.6 billion light years away. Today's telescopes pick them up. But that's what love is. That's what light is. Hashem should give us all the power and the strength and the empowerment to be able to find our light and to be able to spread that light. Yafutsu, my nesecha The light should spread far and wide and the whole world should be filled with light. It should be a shnas oira, a year of light, and a shnas bracha, and a shnas gila, and a shnas ditza. All the oasis of olive bays, like we say in the Musaf of Yom Kippur, until Toph, yeah? Shnas Teire, Shnas Tfila, Shnas Tshuva, Shnas, uh, Shnas Tikkun, all the way from Aleph to Toph, all the brachas individually and collectively, B'Toch Klal Yisrael, and a Shnas of Geula, a year of, of true redemption, Lamaila, Lamata, Geula Klalus, and Geula Pratus, individually and collectively. Bimheira B'Yameinu, Amen and a good bench there. The only love I need, I have a young